Today, I'm talking about the serverless runtime that is being built on top as an open source project on top of the Beam. My name is Marcel Lanz. I'm a Beam and Erlang ecosystem outsider so far. I work in the Swiss fintech insurance industry, mostly with Java or JVM based enterprise systems on the server built the last 20 years. Before that, I spent some time in the sometimes dark, deep, low level space of networked, embedded, and real time systems. I divided my talk into the following parts. First, we will define what serverless is about in the context of our project. Second, I'll show how, through a little dilemma, we motivated to use serv serv <coughs> serverless technology. And the last two parts are about the IKE project and its implementation of a serverless runtime. So let's get started. Let's start with a little poll. So how many of you run some serverless production workload in the cloud? Give some hands, I see. Six, six out of, I don't know, 80 people. How many of you run entire production workload in the cloud? One, two, oh, more than before, right? Okay. Do you run it in the cloud or somewhere else? Um, and how many of you would trust the cloud provider with your entire production workload built as a serverless system, and therefore you don't own the whole stack uh, on, con on control, don't control all of your stack's code? I see one. Interesting, thanks. So I, I took a, a WOVA poll yesterday evening. I got answers. So at least in online, it seems many more have a, a, production, a production workload in the cloud. And even 57% trust um, um, a cloud provider or would trust a cloud provider with their production workload. As this talk is about serverless, let's define what it is in a this definition. So a serverless architecture is a way to build and run applications and services without having uh, to manage infrastructure. And your application is still running on servers, but all the servers, server management is done by AWS. So <coughs> this was by the AWS, so that they like to manage your servers, right? There's a second one. Serverless is a cloud native development model that allows the developers to build and run applications without having to manage servers. There are still servers in serverless, but they are abstracted away <coughs> from app development. I think this is from Edat. I think this is even better. In our context for this talk, let's agree that serverless compute, also called function as a service, is our way how to run code. So instead to deploy a whole application, we use the function as an abstraction and we are able to deploy these functions. I think AWS Lambda was one of the first instances of such an abstraction that got promoted to products at being run on AWS. A few weeks ago, this is a message thread has been retweeted. I won't read it, I only quote parts. But it shows, well, how some of us live in another world while another reality, reality moves forward with what is possible in the cloud. So in terms of realities for enterprise developers, the functions as a service development model is fundamentally different to how systems have been built for many years. Also, a service runtime, or better say, products, usually can't be deployed on premise, but instead are offerings of a cloud provider. Depending on your business, your tradition, or how you generally trust such an offering, you don't want to give a cloud provider so much trust to build your entire business on it. It's fair to say also that vendor lock-in is a risk for some in this regard. 
For many companies, it's very <clears throat> hard to move away from their existing year-long, often year-long and established investment in their technology stack. In the field of enterprise, it's often exactly defined, exactly defined what te technology can be used for systems development. From my experience, <clears throat> in some of these companies, switching technical grounds is nearly impossible without very, very good reasons. This applies to the fleet of programmers doing the daily work of boring business software and has, has been um, maintained for years. So even if you think, as an example, the Beam and Elixir or Go, to name another language, is more appropriate to solve a problem, it's way more likely that we would stick with, the, with what we allow to use. In the enterprise world, it's often a Java or JVM-based stack. To change this is nearly impossible. So the last few years, even the last companies found their way to have a strategy to move to the cloud. What happens there is that existing applications, often monoliths by their own, are packaged into a container image and then deployed to Kubernetes or a container runtime. Regardless if this makes any sense of how Kubernetes works, it's the strategy to use a modern build and continuous deployment pipeline. This by itself has advantages for sure, like the aspect of automating the deployment and eliminate manual steps in the process. For organizations without a strong engineering culture, moving to the cloud is often dri driven by operational aspects of how their system have been working so far. Should they make the switch from bare metal servers and from bare metal servers um, to virtual machines? But they, they're running their own infrastructure in their own networks with their own compliance or to standards, and especially their burden to be able to scale their workload if they have to, to scale up, but also to scale down. I explained why it seems not possible. I explained why it seems not possible to move um, for away from the from existing old technology. Since we are talking about also a serverless runtime, there must be a way to do it. And I think this way is quite radical. As we haven't learned how to use our tools sometimes that have a lot of freedom, it's time to reduce this degree of freedom and start to migrate away from, uh, to, to migrate <coughs> the, way, the way to implement functionality systems and enhancements with an abstraction we have here with serverless compute. For sure, this is not an easy task but it also doesn't make any sense to just run legacy code in a cloud native environment and at the same time, don't gain any advantage out of it. Some are observability and traceability, decoupling, scaling, geolocation, the ability to run parts of the workload in parallel, simply also to be able to version features and last as for a monolith, being able to roll out new versions without shutting down your server and having downtimes. We don't have to, uh, to move completely to a new language or paradigm. We could just use it differently. And this is what serverless or function as a service can bring to the, to the topic. Let's go now to, to the second part of my, of my talk. Uh, Iger is a, an open source project we've initiate, initiated after a cloud state, another project, an open, open source project, had been terminated. Cloud state, after its end, was revealed as a testbed exploring state management in the serverless space. It had identified, it, identified that state management is the hardest part of function as a service. Besides exploration, how to build 
uh, state management in this space, it defined a protocol. The protocol is and was cloud state's most valuable asset as an open source project. It defined how to run different state models so that functions don't have to know and so they don't have to connect to a database or they don't have to connect to a stateful service. Cloud state was terminated, but it was also a success. The open source community around it implemented not only the very popular and well-known CRUD, aka entity state model, the community also provided implementation for SDKs for the framework for six additional languages. One language even had the full support of all state models. I will explain shortly. So <clears throat> the core of cloud state was built on a popular JVM active framework called ACA. Its creator Lightband also led the cloud state pr project, open source project. Today, Lightband provides a commercial implementation of parts of the original cloud state project in the in form of their Calyx platform. So while the commercial implementation had been built, the cloud state open source community started the IGA project to implement the open source implementation of the cloud state protocol. So let's dive now into what we are doing with the uh, IGA functions project. So IGA is our chosen, IGA functions are chosen name for that and is an implementation of the cloud state protocol. No surprise here, right? What is different is the base technology we've chosen to implement it. We decided not to compete with the ACA project and their creators. It seemed not to make any sense to continue to, the, to use the abandoned code base or to rewrite in Scala on the JVM again. We iterated on a few options. We considered to use Go or Rust, but first we came to the conclusion that to rewrite a system like ACA or ACA cluster was too much work. Go would have been an appropriate option. As Go is widely used for cloud software, and as much as I like Go, its simplicity as a language, and also its tooling and concurrency model, the building blocks we needed to just, were just not there with it. So we, could, we considered something else, and I think you might um, guess it what it is. Some of us had experience with Elixir, and we, we thought, what could be better suited than to use the technology ACA was based on and inspired of? originally. Also, the cloud state model implemented a virtual actor-like system with its protocol. Acker took the best part of Erlang, according to its creator, and brought it to the JVM. Why shouldn't we take the best parts of Acker, bring it back to Erlang, right? So the decision was made to use the Beam and implement our system with it, and it is where the excitement about to use Erlang began for us. We decided not to name our project Eiger Serverless. Even if you think that serverless is an appropriate term, there might be a better name for it, or there is more than just the aspect that is something without servers. As I explained already, the cloud state protocol, and now IGA protocol, is one important part of our system. Language SDKs are the second one. And third is a message proxy that we now implement on the Beam in Elixir. While from a language perspective, I like Erlang for its simplicity, the majority of the project member preferred Elixir, and this is fine. Let's have a look how the different components interact as a system to build the runtime. So user functions are just functions, as you could imagine. And these functions are defined with an API-first approach. A function is defined using gRPC. While gRPC is a modern, efficient transport on top of HTTP2 to move data, or better said, messages between clients and servers. 
messages are defined as so-called protocol buffers using the proto, proto file format or encoding. As I explained, we support multiple programming languages in which a function can be implemented. Therefore, and luckily, gRPC has broad support for many languages, so it can be used to generate stops for clients and servers, as well as for, um, for, for any language that supports it, right? It has to, languages that need support of gRPC to work with this concept we, we have here with Eigen. gRPC also supports enhanced features like streaming, both for the client as well as for the server, and even bidirectional streaming on both sides. gRPC, as well as protobuffers, as its message encoding, are established and widely used in cloud software projects for many years. The service proxy I see here, the service proxy is connected to a user function implementation. And the proxy implements a discovery protocol to get to know which services are implemented by a user function deployment. The proxy faces clients who like to invoke user function services, and then it's able to route them to a concrete instance of the user function. We, use the run, we, we run the user functions in Kubernetes, and the proxy itself is deployed as a so-called sidecar. It runs beside the user function in a pod as a process. The sidecar, sidecar pattern is well established for such kind of functionality, and service proxies in general run this way in Kubernetes. There is an optimization where we could run multiple user functions, only running one instance of the proxy, but multiple user functions to save resources. But we concentrate on the standard sidecar pattern for now, where only one proxy is associated to a user function. We just saw how the user function were defined, how the proxy discovers them as a sidecar, and then routes client requests towards these functions deployments running as Kubernetes pods. The actual IGO protocol is divided into two parts conceptually. One part, the proxy protocol, is responsible to discover user functions and route client requests um, or manage errors towards the user function's implementation. The second part, the SDK protocol, represents the state model with which we are able to choose from being a user function. <clears throat> what I just described now is nothing more than the basic concept of how function as a service can be implemented technically. It's pretty simple. But there is more. And what we are able to do is to manage state. This is done in a way where the function itself do not, does not connect to a database, does not connect to a stateful service. The state is brought to the function whenever the function is invoked. The concept can be summarized as inversion of control. We are not getting the state, but it gets, gets to us whenever we, co we, we are called as a function. The concept is shortly uh, illustrated here. We can see if a request comes in, it gets to the service proxy, it gets uh, through the state management component, uh, its state, and is uh, um, bound to a message that enters the function that is implemented. This function can be any language. It can be JavaScript, Go, it can be Elixir, it can be C++. So any language that supports gRPC as a technology. There is a so-called context usually used. With context, we can do some nasty stuff sometimes, but uh, it's, it's used to access envi environmental uh, aspects of, of the protocol sometimes. Then whenever the function is, is um, finished with its function, it creates a response. And the state, the change state of its response is brought back to the state management and the client gets his response. 
There are different state models that a user function can adjust from, uh, can choose from. The simplest model, the action state model, is also a non-state model in the traditional sense. It represents the traditional function as a service, the function that gets a message in and returns a message out. Beside the action protocol, there are models to support event sourcing, CRDTs, and the well-known CRUD model. <clears throat> so one of the most interesting state models is one supporting so-called CRDTs, so conflict-free replicated data types. CRDTs have the ability to converge eventually in a distributed system without further coordination. There are multiple types well known in the CRTD space, and protocol, the protocol uses some of them, like flags, sets, maps, and counters. Implementing CRTDs is, and its state model is not a trivial task. So to implement CRTDs, we are looking to use existing projects on the beam. We started to explore anti the antidote project, a CRDT database, and the recently announced vaccine project that is built on top of Antidote as a possible implementation. There was a great talk yesterday at this conference by James from the, from the vaccine project, introducing the vaccine project. If you haven't seen it, it explains well what is possible with this exciting state model. So this is our current state and challenges. We were, we're working continuously on this project. And see, it's, we are completely open source and do it just for fun, really. Uh, it takes some time sometimes. But we made good progress in the last few months. Our next focus will be CRDTs, the CRDT state model, focus on the JavaScript SDK. This is the most important language. You might not believe, but it's, it's like this. And as well as the test compatibility kit we have for the project. We also identified some, some parts where libraries, uh, like the GRPC and the Lexi implementation, could be improved. It's like uh, performance-wise, sometimes an issue. For sure, we are happy to, uh, if others interested in the project like to join with ideas, collaboration on issues, as well as exploring what's possible in the future. So before closing this talk, let's summarize what we have. Eigenfunction is a serverless runtime. It can be deployed on-premise and also on the cloud. Kubernetes is our operational runtime. Function state is managed as an abstraction. We are running on the beam with its solid proven and fault-tolerant model to operate, and we are not done yet. You might have noticed or noted that Eiger, as a project, has derived its name from a Swiss mountain. This is from where I am. You might have guessed that too. And this picture uh, here sh shows what happened in August, about 10 years ago, when the beams of the sun touched the lower base of the Eiger Mountain. And it lasted only a few minutes before the sun set behind the horizon. It was really this way. So that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marcel. Do we have any questions? Perhaps from somebody who is running this kind of things and is feeling confident in adopting them. I am not one of those people. Um, if not, let's thank Marcel once again.